welcome. Um, we are joined today by our friends at uh, San San in San Diego at UCSD, uh, the San Diego Nanotechnology Infrastructure, or SDNI. And if you have tuned in previously to our um, Takeout Science program, you will have seen their faces a few weeks ago when we hosted them and we got to go under the sea. So today's session, again, like I said, is going to be a little bit different. Um, we're going to start with a video that was put together by an undergraduate at UCSD that works a lot with their facility, and her name is Almira, and she is actually finishing up exams this week. Um, they're on the quarter system out there in California, so she was unable to do the, join us today live, but she's going to uh, she put together a really nice video that I will share with you guys um, now. Um, if you have questions throughout the broadcast, you can type them into the um, chat window and that should go to the hosts. Um, and then at the end, um, we will have a Q&A um, and after, sorry, let me back up. After the brief 20 minute presentation by Elmira, we'll go into a live session with Ryan um, where he'll be showing us some things on the SEM and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So again, don't be shy, ask your question throughout and um, we'll start sharing now. Hi guys, my name is Almira Desena. I am an undergraduate student at UC San Diego with a major in applied mathematics and a minor in math education. I also work for the San Diego Nanotechnology Infrastructure or SDNI. And later on, I'll be joined by my boss, Dr. Ryan Nickel and he'll show you some really cool stuff on the scanning electron microscope. So I hope you guys stick around for that. Um, if there's anything that you guys can take away from today's session, it could be as unrelated as just keeping an open mind. I obviously come from a more mathematical background. Um, and really before I started my job, I didn't really know much about nanotechnology as a whole. So, um, I never expected that a year later I'll be here in front of you guys, you know, talking to you all about the world of nano. Um, anyway, without further ado, let's go ahead and uh, start on our topic for today, that is colors. So let's start off with something simple, the color black. Well, what is black? Well, really black is not a color. Black is the absence of color. Black is also the absence of light. So what do I mean? Let's say that you're in a room, in a sealed room, where there is no source of light. So there is no windows, there is no doors, nothing. What are you gonna see? You're not gonna see much, actually. In fact, you're not gonna see anything at all. And in order for you to see something, well, you're gonna need light. So really, what is light? Well, light is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum which covers radio waves to gamma rays. What do I mean by this? Well, to give you guys some examples, electromagnetic waves are radio waves, the waves from your microwave, your Wi-Fi, or even your cell phone. So really, these waves are everywhere, but we can't see them. The only difference between the waves that I just mentioned are their wavelengths. So here I have a, a graph for you guys. So right here on the left, we have something called our radio waves. And we say that these waves have a longer wavelength. And why is that? Well, if I look from peak to peak, so this thing is called a peak, from peak to peak, it's gonna take a longer time for me to get there, right? So we say that these have a longer wavelength. On the other side, we have something called our gamma rays or our gamma waves. We say that these waves have a shorter wavelength and why? Well, let's look at it from peak to peak. We can see that it takes um, a much shorter time for me to get from this peak to the next. So we say that these have a shorter wavelength. Light is an electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths ranging from 380 nanometers to 760 nanometers. What do I mean by that? All I'm saying is that light is somewhere within this model, and it's actually right here in the middle. 
in the visible light spectrum, which is this thing right here, ranges from 380 nanometers to 760 nanometers. So to give you guys a better idea, radio waves are detected by our ears. That's actually how we hear sound. And then the visible light spectrum is detected by our eyes. That's, that's how we see light, right? Or that's how we see color. So you guys can think about it this way. When I'm looking at something that has a certain color, let's say red, right? My eyes are just communicating to me their wavelength. So when I'm looking at something that's red, my eyes are going, oh, that thing is 740 nanometers. But I don't understand it that way. Instead, I just see the color red. Similarly, if I'm looking at something that's purple, let's say, my eyes are going, oh, that thing is 400 nanometers, right? Because right here, 400 nanometers. And instead of me saying, oh, that's 400 nanometers, my eyes are going, oh, that thing is purple. So I have another model for you guys. All this model here is saying that light can be broken up into seven components where each component has a specific wavelength tied to a specific color. So we can kind of see that already, right? So on this side right here, we have white light that is under vacuum. This white light enters the crystal prism where the first refraction occurs. And then it exits the crystal prism to return in the vacuum where the second refraction occurs. This leads to a dispersion of light components with respective wavelengths and associated colors, meaning the waves will be deviated at different angles depending on their wavelength. So what I'm trying to say is that white light is separated based on its frequency. So the shorter wavelength, like the purple right here, will be at the bottom. And then the red at the top has the longer wavelength. So here, when I look at white light, all it's saying is that white light has all of these different wavelengths in it. So with that in mind, let's go ahead with um, the first way we can generate colors. That is through pigments. So I'm pretty sure we've all seen pigments before, but maybe we just weren't aware that that is what a pigment is. So what are pigments? Well, pigments are chemicals that add color to a material. Seems pretty simple. There are two types of pigments, inorganic and organic. Inorganic pigments um, are dry minerals or metal-based, and organic pigments contain carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. The way we observe colors here is through wavelength selective absorption. So where have I seen pigments before? Well, really, if you look outside, you should already uh, see an example of organic pigments. And that is through the trees, that is through the leaves. So have you ever wondered why is it that the leaves are green? Well, we all know from our science class that uh, leaves have a certain molecule that uh, gives them their green color. And that molecule is called chlorophyll. But have you ever wondered what is chlorophyll doing that lets them have the, their green color? Well, I mean, since we're imagining ourselves in this scenario, we know that if we step outside, we know we're gonna get light, right? Outside, we have light. So that light is going to hit the leaves and then, and then we know that the leaves have chlorophyll, right? So the light is going to interact with the chlorophyll molecules, and the molecules will absorb some of the light. Um, and we can see this a little bit more clearer with the absorption spectrum. So if we take a look at this graph here, the absorption pattern occurs at around 380 nanometers to 500 nanometers, roughly. 
and then from 600 nanometers and above. So I get this little bit here that is not absorbed. And if I were to match that up, I can see that the wavelengths of this size and the wavelengths of this size are getting absorbed, so I'm, I cannot see them. But the wavelengths of, of this size are not getting absorbed, so really the greens. That's why I get the green color. Now let's look at an example of inorganic pigments. So inorganic pigments can actually be found in industrial paint. And the way this happens is that the color that we see is the color that is not absorbed by the compound that is in that certain paint. So remember, inorganic pigments can be composed of metals and dry minerals. Therefore, we can manipulate certain compounds to produce certain shades of color. For example, let's go ahead and take the black right here, the carbon black. We see that the carbon black has the carbon compound. What is the carbon compound doing? Well, that the carbon absorbs all of the wavelengths, which is how we see black. If we take a look at the blue here, we can see that the blue has the compound cobalt stannate, which means that this compound does not absorb this shade of blue, which allows us to see that certain color. Similarly for green, we have the compound chromium oxide, and the same thing happens. So remember, one way we generate color is through absorption. In other words, the colors that we see are the wavelengths or the waves that are not getting absorbed. So why don't we go ahead and take a look at another way we can generate color, and that is through luminescence. So there are four major ways that we can see colors through luminescence. Fluorescence and phosphorescence, chemiluminescence, and bioluminescence. So let's first talk about um, fluorescence and phosphorescence. And in order for me to do that, we need to go back to the spectrum. So let's say we want to see all of the light here in the visible light spectrum. What kind of source should we use? Well, light excites the fluorescent media, and then the media emits light with a longer wavelength. Since we want to cover the entire visible spectrum, we can use the UV light as our excitation source. So that's why we use ultraviolet light to see fluorescence and phosphorescence, right? Because if we aim here, we're not gonna miss any of these colors. So, chemiluminescence. For chemiluminescence, energy is released in the form of light as a byproduct. This energy release is a chemical reaction and the color depends on the wavelength. Bioluminescence is a type of chemiluminescence that happens in living organisms. So there's actually something really cool that happened um, a few weeks ago um, that I actually had the opportunity of seeing. And um, it happened um, at La Jolla Shores. And maybe you can already take a guess to what it is. So, at that time, the waves were glowing. These were called um, bioluminescent waves. But why? Have you ever wondered why the waves glowed? Well, it was because during that time, there were so many phytoplanktons in the sea that the organisms made the waves glow. And then in the morning, um, the ocean actually looked uh, reddish, like muddyish reddish, because of the abundance of phytoplanktons. Other examples of bioluminescence include the firefly, which we know they glow at the bottom here, and jellyfish. Fluorescence. So remember, in order to catch all the light, we can hit it with UV lights. They have certain compounds that will then absorb some of the UV light's energy and give back a different light or wavelength. So here we have different examples of fluorescence. 
depending on the molecule, we get certain colors. So for example, I have some examples right here. Quinidine will emit like a bluish color, like a blue color. Fluorescein gives you a green color. Rhodamine D gives you orange. Acridine gives off like yellow. And pyridine one has like a burgundy color. So now that we've talked about um, color generation through luminescence, let's uh, talk about something different. Plasmonic colors. What are plasmonic colors? So here's a food for thought for you guys. Let's say you have a bar of gold. What do you think would happen if that bar of gold is so, so, so tiny? Do you think it'll still have the same color? So in order for us to answer that question, we first have to talk about metal surface plasmonic resonance. What are plasmons or what are surface plasmons? Just as light consists of photons, free electron driven plasma oscillation consists of plasmons. Plasmons confined to surfaces strongly interact with light. Plasmonic resonance, is upon plasmonic resonance, the incident light photons are absorbed and the energy is transferred to electrons, which convert into surface plasmons. So let's talk more about this. What is the plasmon resonance? Well, when light interacts with the surface of a bulk piece of gold, the resonance frequency is limited, right? So the result is only in one color, which is gold. So when gold is broken down into nanoparticles, the size and shape of the nanoparticles have an influence on the resonance frequency and light absorption occurs at different wavelengths resulting in different colors. So that's what happens when we have gold that are really, really tiny. It does actually change its, co its colors. To further illustrate this, why don't we look at um, nanoparticles that are 80 nanometers in size. So here I have a image, an image of a, an 80 nanometer gold nanoparticles. This was actually taken by our own scanning electron microscope, our Zeiss scanning electron microscope. Um, and let's see what color this has. So here we have different colloidal solutions of the gold nanoparticles. So at 80 nanometers, it achieves this kind of color, right? We can see that as the particles decrease in its size, we absorb more of the blue section of that visible spectrum. So we see more of the red colors. Similarly, if we increase the size of the nanoparticles, we absorb more of the red section, which makes it so we can see more bluish, reddish colors. So keep in mind here that the plasmon red, red the, so keep in mind that the plasmon resonance will lead to absorption of light, which generates colors. So lastly, we have structural colors. Okay. This butterfly is not blue. Well, this is actually the blue morpho butterfly and we'll take a look later why the butterfly isn't blue. So, but first we have to talk about structural colors. So structural color is based on reflection, not absorption. This is because of the nanostructure that light interacts with, which makes it so that at certain angles we see certain colors. Remember the prism? Well, it kind of has the same concept where the refraction pattern will depend on the thickness of the material and its overall structure. So you can get positive and negative interference. Negative interference means you won't see anything, while positive will mean that the color that uh, you get is amplified. So the, the key here is that the structures are closed in size, 
to the wavelength of light. Therefore, multiple reflections from the top and bottom surfaces of the structures uh, give you that negative and positive interference. So remember, our reflections can add up or they can cancel out, resulting in different colors depending on your viewing angle. So if I take a look at certain examples, have you ever wondered why bubbles have a rainbowish color to them depending on the um, angle that you see them at? Well, it's because of structural colors. And the same thing here with the opal. If you guys have ever seen an opal before, you'll see that depending on where you are, their color actually shifts. And it's because, of, because they have their own um, nanostructures. So I have a simulation here of structural colors. And this simulation was created by Raymond Wittekamp, I think is how you say his name. Um, and here, this is just a simulation of the simplest periodic material, which is an alternating multilayer. So let's see what happens. Well, here we have wavelengths that are way too long. So here we have our material. Well, we can see that um, the waves are just passing through the layers despite the reflections at each step. When we have wavelengths that is too short, the same thing is happening, right? It's just passing through that material. Nothing is happening. So why don't we see when the wavelength occurs at just the right length? So I'm gonna go ahead and um, slow this down. So when the wavelength is just right, this matches the optical period of the repeating structure and the reflected waves add. What's happening here is called constructive interference. This resonance creates a photonic stop band around that wavelength, reflecting all, almost all of the light backwards. One important consequence of the photonic stop band is that the color you see with your eye depends on which side of the multilayer you're looking at. So if you're on the same side as the source, like right here, the reflected light will be tinted the same color as the photonic stop band. And on the opposite side, you will see the complementary color because the wavelengths within the stop band cannot spread through the material. In each case, light from the source is interacting with the multilayer structure and there is no absorption occurring, only reflection. So now um, we've talked about all four ways we can generate colors. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to my, uh, my boss, Dr. Ryan Nickel, and you guys will be able to see why the butterfly that I showed you earlier, why that color, why the butterfly is not blue. So I hope you guys enjoyed um, and thank you. Yeah, so, I'm going to take a couple steps back and I'm going to show you a couple of different things first. So um, first off, I want to thank Almira for the putting together the lecture. Uh, it went into lots of topics at different depths. So we hope that there was something for everyone. Uh, for my portion, I'm going to step all the way back to the basics. If you're to take anything away from the lecture, it's that there's three categories of color, pigments, plasmonic and structural color. And with the practical demonstration here with the SEM, I hope that, that we can uh, shed some more light on that. So first, let me show you a picture. So here is a ladybug or a ladybird. Uh, this is something I prepared and it's currently inside the microscope. Notice how you can see the black and red and the spots. And I want to first look at this under the electron microscope. Hold on, let me just make sure I get the right screen. Yeah, okay. So if you look very carefully, there's my ladybug. 
and you can see some spots if you look very carefully. I'll just point them out over here. So here's the ladybug. There's a spot, there's a spot, there's a spot. Here's the ladybug under the electron microscope. There are no spots. There was supposed to be a spot here somewhere and a couple of spots on the wings. So the first thing you would say is, well, okay, uh, that's not too interesting. But what I would say is, well, we're going to use the electron microscope to study color, but apparently we can't see color, right? Not only is the electron microscope a black and white image, but here is something that is inherently colorful, but we're not seeing the color, right? We're not seeing the black and the red. This is an example of pigment color. There is something on the ladybug's skin or the wings that cause light to be reflected in different ways. And this particular example, the electron microscope is not sensitive to that change. So we are not seeing the thing that causes the, um, the color changes. Now, this is precisely why the electron microscope is so useful for studying certain types of color. Uh, that is in particular plasmonic color, which we'll get to, and structural color. The SEM or scanning electron microscope is almost a pure probe for structure, meaning that if you were to look at a structure uh, under light, you can get interference of light, but that is not happening in an electron microscope. And we can sort of see past the interference. We can see past the things that obscure our vision. Um, as a short aside note, I actually don't have a good example inside the microscope currently um, because these types of samples are very hard to get. But for those of you that know a little bit more about SEMs, electrons can be affected by color pigments in a different way. And the most uh, standard example of this is uh, staining biological structures with heavy metals. If your pigments or stains have got very heavy atoms in them, the electrons can scatter off them more strongly than other, uh, other types of elements. So in that way, we can actually see pigments under the electron microscope. It's just that they have to have the right chemical composition. So that is something that is very typical in the biological world where I think they use osmium type chemicals, which is a very heavy element to stain their, 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 their samples. So that's pigments. So I wanna go and take a look at plasmonics. So plasmonics is a very complicated sounding word, um, but really, you know, depending on the level of the audience here, if you've ever heard about a photon, it's basically a, 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 the quantum of light, a plasmon is just a quantum of charge oscillation. And really, whenever electrons move around or ions move around, it costs energy. And therefore, plasmonics is the study of uh, moving around those charges. And because of that, the absorption spectra of those types of structures can change and therefore color changes. And the one example is colloidal nanoparticles. So Amira did have an example of this in her um, slide, but let me show you this live. So we purchased some colloidal nanoparticles and we actually make them ourselves here sometimes too. And we drop some onto a little piece of silicon. You can see the droplet there on the top of the screen. It's gonna focus up. And so we put a droplet on here and then we let it dry. And so these were gold particles that looked red, just like Amira showed you in the presentation. And if we zoom in, we can see that this, uh, this liquid was made up of a whole bunch of suspended nanoparticles. So if you bear with me, there's a couple of adjustments I need to make. So here we're looking at nanoparticles that are less than 100 nanometers. So let me uh, explain. So a couple of weeks ago, I was here showing you a human hair, which is about 100 microns. 
And we were looking at structures which were about, uh, about that size or maybe a little less. Today, because we're studying color, color uh, from visible light is between wavelengths of around 300 to 700 nanometers. So the structures that we are looking at have to be around that size. And so we are really using the full capabilities of this microscope in that we are looking at structures that are smaller than the wavelength of light. This is something fundamentally um, um, nearly impossible to do with optical microscopy. And that's why an SEM is so great. And in fact, if we were to have a whole bunch of different samples of nanoparticles, and we could observe that there were different colors, we could put them in the microscope and see the differences in their sizes. And that's why this type of technique is so useful. One thing that Amira didn't mention in her presentation is that although these are all spherical particles, um, the shape of the particles actually have a big impact on, on the different types of colors. And that's because the resonances can occur in different ways. So right now, the absorption of light is occurring because of resonances on this sort of scale, 100, 100 nanometer um, scale or, or some multiple thereof. And if you've got sharp points or other types of geometrical features, the resonances can change. And that also changes on material. So you can get a whole host of different colors, not just shades of red um, out of these plasmonic resonances. I want to stress, um, you know, for, for any level of uh, student out there, plasmonic sounds like a really complicated word. You can impress your friends with it, but it's really just about charge oscillations or electron or ion oscillations that absorb energy. And in the world of nanotechnology, the absorption is in a particular, um, at a particular wavelength because of the size uh, or the scale of these structures. I've got a whole bunch of other nanoparticles in here, but that, you know, you might not be too interested just to look at different sizes of circles. Um, so let's go and take a look at um, some structural color. Um, so I've got one very household example of structural color. Um, just like Amira pointed out that the bubble shows you different rainbow colors whenever you look at it because of thin film interference, essentially. The same thing happens on the bottom of a CD or optical disc. So in the microscope over here, uh, yeah, here, I have just the bottom of an optical disc. So I've taken some of the reflective foil, the metallic foil from the bottom of the optical disc. And if we zoom in here, we should be able to see what's on the optical disc, which causes uh, the colors. And again, it's all to do with interference. So here's what the bottom of an optical disc looks like. It looks kind of like Morse code. It's binary, right? Dots and dashes for ones and zeros. And uh, if you look carefully at the scale bar, um, the, these structures should be on the order or on the size of red light. Why? Because optical disc readers use red light. So we're looking at anything between four and 700 nanometers. So if we do some, some rough measurements, here is a multiple. The large one is, is double or triple that. And the smaller ones are close to the, to the larger end of, of red light, right? So close to the, the 700 nanometer sort of size. And the reason that you see different color is that light reflected from the top surface here and the bottom surface here can interfere. And depending on the angle, you may get reflections from this part, this part, and this part, and they all combine and interfere. Remember that what we're seeing here is smaller than the wavelength of light or at the very limit of, of it. So if you were to put this CD under an optical microscope, you would get all sorts of interference. You wouldn't be able to see what's happening. Again, this is precisely why using an electron microscope is, is critical uh, for these types of uh, studies because uh, the very thing you're trying to study, which is color, uh, is obscured by your measurement technique in a light microscope. Whereas here, uh, the electrons don't care. Broadly, the electrons don't care. And we can see structures that are on the size scale of 
of light and less, much, much less as in the case of nanoparticles. But this is what's on the bottom of a CD, if you've ever wondered. Um, it's basically information encoded and light is used to read it out. And because light is on the same sort of size as these, uh, as the spacings between these features and, and the reflections from these features, uh, you can actually resolve these just about um, for reading out data. But if you were to put this under an optical microscope, it might not be very clear what's happening. All right. So that is one sort of fabricated example of structural color. I want to spend the rest of my time looking at the butterfly. So the butterfly is awesome. Let me find where that is. Okay, so I've just got a butterfly wing, which is, is, is flat on the surface right now. Um, we're going to look at it side on in a moment. And I'm trying to contend with some of this uh, glowing, which I'll try to get past. So let me see if I can. By the way, this is one of the reasons why we use this microscope. This microscope can see really tiny things really well. And we've got a lot of control over the types of um, voltages that we use and so forth. So you'll notice I'm changing a couple of parameters. I'm actually using quite a low voltage here for those of you that, that know anything about um, electron microscopes in the audience. And that way we can sort of get rid of this, this sort of glowing problem. All right, we're getting close. So you'll notice that, that the butterfly wing is sort of composed of these uh, larger structures. And these larger structures, they're again about the size of a human hair or slightly less, but that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is what's on these structures. Zoom right in here. We're starting to see some structure, right? So these structures, are very small. They are, you've guessed it, smaller than the wavelength of light. And it really makes me work, right? I really have to, you know, use the microscope to its full capabilities here. So bear with me as I try to hone in this uh, optimization. But because these structures are smaller than the wavelength of light, just through the same mechanism of reflection um, and interference as the optical CD, uh, light coming in and interacting with these structures, you can get different types of reflections and interferences and therefore different colors um, based on where you're looking at. It looks like this is not 100% stable. Let me just change the voltage a little bit. So one key word that you might want to look up if you uh, if you want to see more examples of this is iridians. Uh, this is uh, usually used in the context of, of the butterfly example. It's basically uh, interference. So I think without spending too much more time that we're getting there. So you can't really tell from this angle, and that's why we're going to look at these side on in a moment. These are like lots of little fingers pointing upwards. And these fingers pointing upwards have got a much uh, finer structure and detail on them as well, which we want to look at. But again, the key point is that, that these structures are very small. This, this width here is about three or 400 nanometers. And again, that's right in the middle of the visible spectrum. And so light coming in and interacting with these structures, reflecting off of these structures, reflecting off nearby structures and interfering is what gives the butterfly its, its color and its color changing type of phenomena. Again, like all science, you know, looking around and trying to find the best areas is, is often helpful. So let me, let me just sort of look around this flat one just a little bit more. Aha. 
Now we're starting to see a little bit of the side view. You see that there's actually internal structures to these finger-like uh, features that are coming off of the butterfly wings. And this is critical because this is where all of the sort of extra internal reflections are coming from uh, to cause those sort of colors. You'll notice here that we're getting a little bit of charging and, and problems happening uh, because of the fact that this is a non-conductive sample and we're using electrons to look at it. But if you bear with me, I can, I can make sure we can get a nice image of this. Oh, we're getting distortion. Let's see if I can do something else. Incidentally, not only is this a good example of trying to show you something live that's very difficult to do in general, but also uh, this is what it looks like to operate a, an electron microscope whenever you're really pushing the limits, whenever you're really trying to zoom in there and see the best that you can see. So let me... We're a little bit, let me go try and find a different area just one more time. But we're just about seeing what I wanted you to see, which is the critical thing. You're seeing this internal structure. I think my other sample preparation that's in here, we might be able to see that a little bit clearer. So how about we go over there? All right, we're back, okay. So again, uh, just, just to remind you, we're looking at the, the, the wings sort of flat, the laying down, and you might be able to see these things with your naked eye, but on these structures, there are very, very tiny sub micron structures or structures that are about the size of the wavelength of light and those are the things which cause these extra reflections and interferences, just like the bubble, or similar to the bubble. Again, I could spend all day looking at these, uh, to be honest, and you know, I would love to get you the perfect image of this, but this is the price we pay for live TV. So let me go to the side view, which I think should give us a really clear indication of those finger-like structures that are coming up. It's this one, this really big mount right here. And there's gonna be a little bit of searching around again to find something, but it's well worth it in my opinion. So you can see that we're looking at things side on now. You can sort of see the, the structures that we were looking at flat on a moment ago. If we zoom, oh, here we go. On these structures, you're seeing all of these really, really tiny sub, sub wavelength type of features. I'm hoping there's not distortion. It looks like there is. That's unfortunate. If you give me another moment, I will try uh, lower voltage again. But again, I hope that every, everyone in the audience is, is understanding what they're seeing here. We are using an electron microscope to see features that we could not see otherwise with an optical technique. And the reason itself is, is just as Almiro was explaining in the lecture is that these things interfere and they cause, cause different colors. So the, the interference itself is, is the, the key. So again, if you look at these sort of features that are, are within those fingers, this is what causes the internal reflections, the interference and the color of a butterfly.
And this is what it looks like live. Um, if you Google these types of images, you might see um, something that I could, could show you if, if I had another you know, 15, 20 minutes to really optimize the microscope. But this is live right now in this, uh, in this SEM system here in San Diego. And, and we're able to probe these things. So I really hope that, that this has given you a little bit more insight to the different types of color, the pigments, the plasmonics and structural color, which we've just finished looking at. Uh, in particular, there's a lot of big words. Go back and watch the presentation and use that as a jumping off point for your own study and research. So I'm gonna hand back over to Maude and take any other uh, questions or, or comments. Thanks, Brian. Um, okay, um, does, if anybody has any questions, um, I'm gonna unmute everyone. Um, so if you uh, want to, um, everybody's muting themselves back. <laughs> if you have any questions uh, for Ryan or um, we can also pass off questions to Almira, let us know. Um, and just either shout it out or you can type it in the chat box. Um, if while we're kind of waiting for questions, I briefly just wanted to um, share my screen one more time um, to, let's see. So I just wanted to give a shout out to Matt Pleal at UNM. He is um, uh, a, a colleague of ours um, from the RAIN network and he correctly guessed butterfly. So that's um, our weekly shout out. So thanks to Matt for guessing that. Um, also, Philip Strader, who's on the call right now, um, is going to do, be doing a live SEM session um, with samples that our audience sends in. So if you want to send us something or if you have friends or kids, anybody um, in your life that would want to look at something under the SEM, send it to us. Keep in mind that they need to be fairly small to be able to fit into the instrument. Um, and make sure that it's not something that's super wet or is alive. And also, as Holly would like to point out, don't send us something that you, you kill just for this session. So don't go out and find something and sacrifice it for the sake of takeout science. Um, and more information on that session and also where you can send the sample for that, uh, for that event is available on our website and that's our quick go link that you can use to get to it. Um, and if you have questions about that, you can also throw it in the chat window. Um, I imagine if we get enough samples or several samples, we can also uh, do a couple different sessions over the summer to accommodate all those. Um, so if there are no questions, I think we will sign out. Um, keep in touch with uh, the RTNN Takeout Science Program. Um, we're going to be posting some new types of content over the next come a uh, few months in the coming weeks uh, as schools are closing for the summer or ending the school year's ending we're going to try to do a few more fun activities maybe things that are a little shorter so if you want to share that with your friends and colleagues and family that would be wonderful um, so with that i don't see any questions so I just want to give a big thank you to Eves and Almira and Ryan at um, SDNI for, for hosting today. And we will see you guys um, next week or in the future. And have a great rest of your day wherever you may be. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.